Um, all right, so this talk is called The Universal Library, a novel approach to uh, teaching category theory. Um, so I'm, my name is Paul Danstep. Uh, I was an educator at a science museum called the Exploratorium for about 17 years. Um, so I'm really interested in like public communication around science. Uh, and I, s learned, I started learning category theory about four or five years ago. Um, I'm very much an amateur. I think I take like a journalistic interest in category theory. But what was really fascinating to me in learning it was that it was difficult in a way that no other mathematics I had struggled to learn before had been. It felt like it was really hinged around a kind of shift in perspective or sort of paradigmatic like psychological move. And I'm really curious to understand that better and I think as a, as a pedagogical strategy to try and come up with ways of assisting people and sort of scaffolding them through that transition. So I want to present, I think, a pretty experimental <laughs> idea for how you might approach trying to explain category theory and how I think it might help with some of the uh, typical problems a person encounters. Um, so one way to characterize it, um, or the difficulty of learning category theory, this is from the beginning of Emily Reel's textbook. It is difficult to preview the main theorems of category theory before developing fluency in the language needed to state them. Um, and I think this is very true, like the early stages, you're being given a lot of abstractions which aren't even necessarily complicated, they're just really peculiar relative to what you're used to, and you've got to get through a pretty long onboarding of, of uh, these abstractions. So in, in terms of learning category theory, you have uh, books like uh, Emily's and these other ones, and I would consider these hard introduction to cat introductions to categories. Uh, just in the sense that they presume, the presumptive audience is mathematicians. You're expected to know a good deal about algebraic topology and logic and abstract algebra, and then this language is going to be explained to you in terms of those subjects. And that is an excellent way to show category theory off at its best because it's showing exactly how powerful and versatile it is. Um, there are some other more friendly introductions, uh, Conceptual Mathematics by Levere and uh, David's book, I feel, take a somewhat broader uh, sense of who their audience is uh, and really do try to do more to a, um, sort of equip the learner with what they need as they go along. And then I was saying the only real general audience book I know that really treats category theory is uh, Eugenia Chang's How to Bake a Pie. And this book's kind of amazing because it, it, it is a totally great, adequate explanation of what category theory is, but it doesn't explain anything about the contents of category theory. You don't learn what a functor is. You don't learn what a natural transformation is. I would say it's like it's a, it's a category theorist's explanation of her subject, which is that she doesn't reveal any of the contents. She just specifies it by saying how it's related to everything else, like math and logic <laughs> and cooking. So wh what I'm proposing today is that I think there's room for another sort of class of instructional material that's somewhere between these that on the one hand is not really trying to make a mathematician out of the, out of the reader or the person interacting with it, whatever it is, but is really just trying to inform them about the big ideas of an important subject and uh, really more like the books on the right does really take the abstracts or the structures of elementary category theory like limits and co-limits and adjointness as the objective uh, to try and um, give people some meaningful contact with. Um, some books that I think go in this category, there's a book by Raymond Smullyan called To Mock a Mockingbird, and it's basically a toy treatment of combinatory logic. Uh, the story is you're going through a forest and there's all these birds which are technically combinators and they have a way when they hear one bird call, they have another bird call that they say. And with the benefit of this toy model, Smullyan is able to go through all kinds of stuff from computability theory and like um, Gödel's theorem and other things. Uh, another one I really like is that is also similar to what I'm going to present today is Surreal Numbers by Don Knuth. Uh, supposedly John Horton Conway came up with surreal numbers while studying mathematics and he told the axioms to Don Knuth who then like went into a reverie and like got a hotel room and like wrote this book in a few weeks. And the whole thing is just a dialogue between a man and a woman who find the axioms of surreal numbers etched in stone and then spend the book like problem solving and figuring it out together. So there's this kind of bespoke self-contained uh, strategies for dealing with a, a technically sophisticated subject in a fun kind of recreational way. Um, so the model I want to propose for trying to explain elementary category theory, I first learned about from a story by Jorge Luis Borges called The Library of Babel. The premise of this story is that the universe is just this seemingly endless series of rooms filled with books. It's a big library. And if you look at any of the books, they're all just gibberish. It's just like random letters. 
And what they gradually figure out in the story is that they're sitting on the, like every combinatorially possible book that could be written. So somewhere out there there's A-A-A-A-A-A, and somewhere else there's A-A-A-A, with just a B at the end, and so on. So the story kind of trips out on all the weird stuff that must be in there. There's a detailed history of the future, a faithful catalog of the library, thousands and thousands of false catalogs, the proof of the falsity of those false catalogs, the true story of your death, the translation of every book into every language, the interpolations of every book into all books. Um, so it's a great like, little philosophical object. It's a, it's a beautiful story, um, but it also has a lot of uh, sort of mathematical value. Um, some there's a lot of people who have taken this up in different ways. The logician Willard von Ormond Quine has a really nice little essay in this book where he sort of um, stages a mock discovery of binary notation by thinking about how to make the library smaller. Um, this book has a explanation of the Banach Tarski paradox, which is a, a kind of a paradox from um, set theoretic geometry where you can take a sphere and divide it into a finite number of parts and reassemble it into two spheres of the same volume as the first. Uh, Ian Stewart kind of takes the library and describes a dissection method based on the letters that sort of matches the Banach Tarski dissection. Um, there's actually a whole book by the mathematician William Bloch, which uh, just goes through Borges library from the perspective of number theory, uh, uh, topology, I think. Um, anyway, there's, you can make a little mathematical meal out of all of uh, the different ways of looking at this library. Um, and what I've been thinking about for the last year or so is that there, there's, there actually is a way to look at the library and embellish it a little bit and turn it into the category fin set. So it's the um, category of finite sets and functions. And kind of my claim is that I think that this, this metaphor, this analogy is actually um, an adequate setting within which to kind of characterize basic, basic category theory. So uh, the plan for this talk is I'm just gonna explain how to think of the universal library as FinSet. And that's actually the whole talk it took me. It's, it's gonna take me as many slides, it's take as much talking as I can do in one sitting is what it's gonna take. So at the end, I'll just make some overtures about where I think this could go. Um, I have some outline about how you might uh, be able to show limits and co-limits, a jointness and representables uh, using this uh, mental model. Um, I should say that like my motive in bringing, I've just kind of had this thought to myself for the last year or so and I thought it was mature enough that it'd be interesting to put in front of some actual category theorists to see what they would say. Um, but I, I also appreciate that this might be a highly idiosyncratic way of thinking about it or that it may be totally overextending this metaphor. So I'm mostly just interested in honest feedback. Um, but it is also kind of an invitation. I have. I have gotten a lot out of thinking about this. has helped me and my own understanding a great deal. Um, so if anyone finds this amusing, uh, I'd love to have people to talk to about how to stage um, these, these sections, which are still kind of under development. Okay, so we're going to be given every book of every length written in every alphabet. So this is the main object we're gonna be working with is a book. Book is characterized by two ingredients. Every book uh, has an alphabet of letters that it draws from and every book also has a specific length, so a certain number of those letters uh, that it contains in sequence. Um, we, well, Borges' book uh, had, all the books were a fixed length, they were all 410 pages, and they all used a single alphabet of 25 letters. We are gonna be a little bit more expansive in that we are going to have books of every length and uh, alphabets of every letter every length as well. So we, have a, we actually have an alphabet with no letters, we have an alphabet with one letter, an alphabet with two letters, an alphabet with three letters, and so on. Um, so these are the first eight, but we have an infinite sequence of uh, integer length alphabets to choose from. Um, the important thing is that the symbols representing each letter need to all be distinct uh, so that we can tell them all apart. And it's actually nice if you have one letter from a given alphabet that it bears some family resemblance to the other letters in that alphabet, just so we can know what we're looking at when we see one. And the other thing is that these don't come with any sense of order. So these are non-ordered alphabets. So they're just basically sets uh, of letters. Uh, and so that's what our books will be written in. And then on the other end of things, we have books of every length. So we have a kind of a format or a, a, a template for each book length. This is a book with no spaces, so it can contain no, later, no letters. This one you can see has available space for one letter. Uh, we have two letter books three letter books. So these are empty book templates that we will fill <laughs> in order to make a real book. So if it take a full, sorry, is there a question? It's just one page. <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it was a bit of a trick to figure out how to depict this without having to have animated pages turning. 
So let's write a book using this alphabet of this length. Basically, each space freely chooses uh, one of these letters. So we have triangle, square, triangle, circle is our book. Um, so this is an example of a four space, three alphabet book. Uh, there are several others. Uh, in fact, there are 81 different combinations you can make with this particular type signature. So we'll call this just, we'll call this a collection, right? This is the collection of all books that can be written, the four space, length uh, three space alphabet and we're going to keep when we receive the library for investigation it's going to come to us uh, separated into these collections so each collection is going to be housed in a big rectangular warehouse like this so imagine this is a big chamber you can walk into and it's full of books um, we're going to have infinitely many of these laid out in a big array and the logic of it is that we have our various alphabets in sequence along the right uh, and our various books of various lengths uh, associated along the left. So every chamber in this aisle is going to be filled with books that have been written in a three-letter alphabet. And every chamber uh, in this aisle is going to consist of books that are two, two spaces long. So if we zoom in on the intersection, for example, we can see that in the two space three alphabet collection, we have nine books. Um, we don't have an order on the alphabet, so there's therefore no presumptive order on these books either. So when we go into these chambers, the books are just kind of like in a pile on the floor. <laughs> but uh, in the back of every chamber, there is a shelving unit, and it has exactly as many slots as there are books in that chamber. So we could put these books into some kind of order uh, if we chose to. That seems to be kind of the expectation. And this is the situation in every one of these chambers. We got a big pile of books. Uh, the piles get quite big uh, as you go off in either direction. And uh, we, what we want to do is try and figure out a way of shelving them. So the way to do this systematically is we're going to go back to our set of alphabets and we're just going to go through them one by one and we're going to choose an alphabetical order on these sets. Um, and it turns out it really doesn't matter what order we choose. Um, in the end, we'll figure something out and we'll be able to look back at this moment and realize that we would have discovered the same thing no matter what we did here. But in order to make that discovery, it does appear to be necessary at this point to make a provisional commitment about what order we imagine these symbols are coming in. And then to make it a little more legible, I'm going to swap out these letter forms with something a little bit more consistent. So we'll just say, uh, if an alphabet has a first letter, it'll be shaped like an A. If it has a second, it'll be a B. And we'll just use color uh, to distinguish between the different alphabets. So like these two books both contain all A's, but this one's clearly written from the singleton alphabet, whereas this one's from, I think, that one. Uh, so. What do we get from alphabetical order? So we actually get three kinds of organizational principle from having made uh, this, these choices. The first thing is it allows us to put the books on, a shel on the shelves in a consistent way. So here we are back in that uh, two space, three alphabet library. It's no longer circles, squares, and triangles. We've changed it to yellow, A, B, and C. So these just contain pairs of A, B, or C. And uh, the contents of this one is AA, that's alphabetically the first uh, volume, and that followed by AB, AC, and so on. So any uh, books which use this as, its con as their content alphabet now have a natural uh, alphabetization for how they should be uh, put on those shelves. The second thing we get is an internal coordinate system. So we don't just organize the books relative to others in the same collection. We actually have a labeling system for the contents of each book. So this book has four spaces, um, and they're presented in order. So I could say that's the first space, that's the second space, and so on. But I also have a handy set of or, uh, four ordered elements that I can use as a, a labeling system for these spaces. So I can say that's the green eighth letter of this book, the green B, the green C the green uh, D and so on. So uh, one thing this does is, uh, well, I should say, okay, so we basically now have two alphabets associated with each book. There's the content alphabet, and we think of that as the content that the book came with, right? It's indelibly printed into the page. And then we have this labeling alphabet, and this is really something we've imposed on this book. So we've come up with an order, maybe we wrote it into the books, or maybe it's in the eye of the beholder, like this is just a notion of literacy. But anyway, each book combines now two alphabets. Um, here's, uh, six, here's six books from that chamber. It's all still gibberish, but it's now like consistently indexed uh, gibberish. Um, but the main thing is that this setup is associating each letter in the labeling alphabet with some letter in the content alphabet, which is the definition of a function between finite sets. So each book really is a function. Um, 
And I want to emphasize how this library-based model of set is kind of psychologically different from a traditional bag of dots characterization of set, which is that when you're learning set theory this way, the things in question, the things you handle and think about primarily are the elements and the sets, and the functions are these kind of more abstract structured relationships between those things. And so when you're going to category theory, you, want to, you have to make this transition from what is a like objects first example to a morphisms first formalism that you're trying to get to. Um, so if you think about these books, there's almost a perfect like figure ground switch in terms of thinking of uh, FinSet in this way. Now the thing you're handling is a book and the book by its structure like contains all the data for a function. And meanwhile, the, the objects, the alphabets in question, these are a little bit more um, like subsidiary structures, um, you know, it's a little ambiguous. It might be a labeling alphabet or a content alphabet, depending on how it's being used in a given book. So the foreground thing you have to think about is uh, the books, which are which are the morphisms. So this, I think, it kind of puts you on a better footing for a discourse that's going to head into category theory. So on that previous one, you're saying that that book would be in the aisle for the next one. Uh, which one? Yes. Uh, yeah, and f yeah, it's four space, six alphabets, and this is the six letter alphabet that it's drawing from. So does that make sense? Can I should keep moving? <laughs> okay. Okay, so the, the third thing you get is uh, a law of composition on these books. And this brings it to another thing that I think is perhaps useful about this metaphor because books are common objects so there's lots of storytelling or motivated narration you can do around like things you would do with books so this is a decoder ring <laughs> right there's a kind of activity where you can encrypt stuff codes are fun to play with so you can kind of tell a story where i'm going to take this book and maybe i'm going to apply a letter substitution code using some kind of decoder ring that takes it from the green four letter alphabet to the purple seven letter alphabet so some setting of that ring would take A to G and B to D and C to F and so on. But actually, once again, this data is precisely a way of associating a labeling alphabet with a content alphabet. That is, we can take the book GDFA and use it as a letter substitution code for books which have this content alphabet in common with this labeling alphabet. So what that substitution looks like is I've got B in that first slot, so it's my substitution code tells me to replace it with a purple D. Uh, I've got green D gets replaced with purple A, and green A gets replaced with purple G. Um, so that's, uh, so this book turns that book into that book, but if we look at it on an elements in sets level, this is just function composition. Um, so we have now a kind of code-based way of um, introducing function composition, and now we have FinSet, right? We have uh, all possible functions and a notion of what it means to compose them. Um, one thing you can do with this is, is now you can start to talk about what the different kinds of morphisms in a category on the basis of this metaphor. So like an identity morphism is one that has every labeling letter in its, as its content letter as well. But with the benefit of thinking about it in terms of codes, you can also say this is a uh, letter substitution code that doesn't do anything or that is unaffected by any other letter substitution code. Um, things like isomorphisms are excellent codes. They can only be decoded one way and the decoder can be used as the code and the code can be used to decode that. There, there's some other things you can get into about monomorphisms and epimorphisms and things. But um, I think the main thing that's actually really interesting to me is that this model of FinSet gives you a way of thinking about composition in two different ways. So um, let me take these two books. I'm going to just apply the letter substitution. So the A's get F's and the B's get C's. Um, and so now we have three books in a compositional relationship. And the question is, is this actually an important relationship? Um, it might seem like it isn't because it actually seems to depend critically on what choices of alphabetical order I've made. So I've chosen to imagine that A is the first letter and B is the second letter of this content alphabet and this labeling alphabet. But if I change my mind, if I decide that maybe B is the first letter and A is the second, then what changes is that now I have to reconsider how I've labeled the contents of my letter substitution code. Now I'm thinking the first uh, slot is B and the second slot is A. And that's going to change the effect of the letter substitution. Now the Bs get Fs, the Cs get As, and now the result of uh, application doesn't match anymore. 
So it might seem like a pretty superficial um, kind of relationship, this composition. But let's remember that, well, let's put this back to AB and let's remember that one of the first organizational principles we got from choosing alphabetical orders is that it put all the books onto shelves. So these three books are sitting on three shelves somewhere. Um, this book, ABBA, is uh, actually the seventh book alphabetically in a 16 book, alphabet, or a 16 book chamber. This one is the 30, 33rd book out of 36 books. And the final one is uh, the 1170th book alphabetically in a chamber containing uh, 1,296 books. So another way to describe this exact composition is to say that the book in slot seven composed with the book in slot 33 is the book in slot 1170. Um, so when I change my alphabetical order from AB to BA, this actually affects the alphabetization of the books in, on these shelves that use it as a content alphabet. So here I have ABBA in slot seven. But let me back up. Uh, so this is the whole alphabetized shelf from AAA on the left to BBB on the right under the assumption that this is alphabetical order. So when I change that, it's now exactly wrong. BBB should be the first letter and AAA should be the last book. Um, and so in fact, all of these books are in the wrong place. So we're gonna have to move all of them around in order to uh, achieve alphabetization according to this new rule. And in the process, ABBA, which was in slot seven, has been moved out of there. And a new book has been moved in. And this is BAB. So to recap, the effect of changing our sense of alphabetical order changes the labeling on those two slots, but it also puts an entirely different book into slot seven. And these two changes actually cancel out. If I apply this letter substitution code, now B's get F's, C's get A's, or, or, or whatever. <laughs> the books come out the same. So my, my alphabetical order switch has, a, has had two effects which have canceled out and I can remain, it remains true that the book in slot seven composed with the book in slot 33 equals the book in 1170. Um, there's also this content alphabet in this book and the output book. Uh, if I change that by, say, putting A at the end, now I get a new 33rd book in that library and a new 1170 book in that library. And once again, those are in compliance. So if I apply the letter substitution code, um, I get the same thing as I would have had before. That is, it remains true that the book in slot seven combined with the book in slot 33 is 1170. So there's this notion that composition is actually well-defined at the level of the slots in the shelves. And any alphabetization I choose is just an implementation of that compositional structure. So if I could go through and just mark these slots and keep track, like kind of memoize where, what all of the compositional structure was at the shelves, I wouldn't even need the books anymore, right? You wouldn't need to do this like arbitrary business with alphabetization. So this is a representation of FinSet that really does support two concrete alternative points of view on what composition is. And I would argue that this one's really compelling because it's almost like it, it's, it's a, almost a static universal characterization of um, composition. And then you have this, all these different ways of implementing it using these books, any two of them are different only by change in like the permutation of the alphabetical order. Um, so uh, in some sense, it's composition that is unique up to unique isomorphism. Um, so when I was first thinking about this, I thought it would be compelling to try and switch back and forth between these views as a way of talking about categorical structures. And I found that it was still really hard to think about shelf-based composition. So I have found that it's really psychologically helpful to introduce a new character into the story at this point, who I call the librarian. Um, so the librarian is best to think of them as being kind of like these, these demigods you meet in these weird logic puzzles where they can only say yes or no and um, you have to try and figure out which is which. which, is which. Um, in the sense that it, the librarian is an interrogative partner. Uh, they're sort of omniscient uh, and they have a limit in what they can say so, and they're not gonna volunteer anything. So you gotta ask all the questions. So the deal with the librarian is that it cannot see the books. This is a being you can talk to who doesn't know what letters are or what the, li what the library's contents are. All it sees is all of the compositional data on all of the uh, slots on the shelves. So we, we've sort of outsourced that knowledge to a fictional being who we might trust to just possess it in our kind of hypothetical uh, 
discussion. Uh, it can't talk, but it can understand requests, and I'll explain what that means in a minute. And we can it can also learn new vocabulary. So you can develop a rapport and a vocabulary with the librarian for the purposes of investigating the library. These are some librarians from my notebooks, which are just fun to draw as little guys with no legs um, that can see everything about the library. Um, so essentially, when I say it can take requests, like if I want to compose two books, instead of going through all the work myself, I can just see which slot numbers they're in, and I can go to the librarian and be like, hey, what's the, com what's the composite of these two? And the librarian sort of sees all of the compositional data at once, so it can very quickly pick out that uh, you want the book in this particular slot. Um, Maybe the librarian starts out only knowing what composition is, but we can, we can invent new terminology. Like if I want to think about commutative squares, you know, I can explain to the librarian that I'm interested in four books. These have the same length. These have the same alphabet. They're composable in a certain way. This is describable in terms of um, what the librarian knows. I haven't done many applied examples. Like in conceptual mathematics and, uh, and in David's book, you know, there's a lot of... Um, you know, reading meaning into the into uh, the category of sets. So, for example, we can talk about directed graphs. This is um, this is this is a diagram in FinSet. Uh, the object, the number, this object is the number of arrows. This object is the number of points. This is standard construction where uh, the first arrow takes. Um, takes the arrows here to their uh, sources, and the second arrow takes the, the same arrows to their targets, and that provides the characterization of some graph, which in book terms means I can go into any uh, chamber and grab two books, and those two books can be interpreted as a graph. Um, if I grab another two books, I get a different graph, and then it's, comp it's a compositionally meaningful embedding of graph into FinSet, because if I can find two arrows which are commutative on the sources and commutative on the targets, that effectively gives me some graph homomorphism between my graphs. So a way you could imagine using the librarian is to say, like, I have this graph I'm interested, this graph I'm interested in, and my librarian knows what a commutative square is. So if I'm like, give me all the pairs of books which can make commutative squares out of these, that's the kind of thing that the librarian can instantaneously offer up. So you can kind of use it as a lookup butler, which is a fun fantasy, but not really, you're never going to actually have the benefit of that service. So it's a, there's a limit to how valuable it is to think about it. What's really valuable is that if the librarian can see this, then the librarian can also see universal mapping properties. So um, if I can define something like a limit with the librarian, I can give them a graph like this and be like, give me the limit over this, which is, I guess, like an equalizer. But really, it's, you know, it's a cone. Uh, and the idea is that this arrow composed with this gives this arrow, and same with the targets. Um, and this is exactly what the librarian would be able to see. You'd be able to look at this diagram, see all of the spans in the entire category, and see that an isomorphism class of them were essentially central. There's one arrow coming in from the tip of every other compositional uh, cone. And of course, this has an internal meaning, right? It picks out the fixed points of the graph. And you can also define co-limits the same way. But this is uh, kind of the concept is that um, by having a series of sessions and talking with the librarian and trying to imagine that the librarian's point of view reveals patterns and structures in the library that you can't see that would be useful for you to know but would be very hard for you to infer by considering the contents of the books themselves. You have a sort of um, synthetic situation where you could stage a mock discovery of uh, some of the concepts in category theory. So I think I'm gonna, yeah. I want to just say, so this is all, this is as much as I got done, but I think uh, what I wanted to say is that, the, well, you know, what makes this interesting is how it proves itself in terms of its ability to um, find, to learn about limits and co-limits, adjointness, and representables. So I'd almost imagine these as three chapters or three sessions with the librarian. I think the arc of these would be like, you try and do something with the books by considering their contents, you have a somewhat unsatisfying uh, uh, experience, and then you close the books, you put them on the shelf, and you try and imagine this from uh, the librarian's point of view. How would you characterize something using only the compositional data? So in the case of like limits and co-limits, you might ask like, how would you summarize two books? Or how would you summarize a collection of books? And you can try and do that by thinking about their contents. Um, but there, it's actually a very disappointing uh, process, and then from the librarian's point of view, you end up with these more universal uh, structures like limits and co-limits. Um, so anyway, uh, like I said, I, this has just been 
kind of a fun way of talking to myself about category theory, um, but uh, I think there is some interesting uh, value. It's been helpful to me, and I would, I would like to imagine it might be helpful to others, so I'm sort of, this is sort of a pet project of mine just thinking about. So if anyone wants to talk someday about how to talk about limits and co-limits, adjointness or representables in terms of the library, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. And that's, that's it. Are there any questions? Are you thinking of turning this into a class or a book? Uh, so I have, I have no idea. I, so, um, discovery room. <laughs> so I have a, I, yeah, this isn't really a project proposal and I have a very open mind about these things. Um, so I've done a lot of digital interactives. Uh, online videos, I think, are an effective way of disseminating this kind of thing. Um, but I think form could follow function in some nice ways. Like there's something about making it into a book that feels kind of appealing to me. It is very self-referential. It's also, and it's not, and maybe not obvious from these slides. The library, there is that <laughs> no, it's so trippy. Um, but I do think as a project, it, it has some availabilities that I think it, it could really be done, I, like I think it'd be done beautifully in a certain number of ways. It, it does have an embedded typographic design problem. Like, you know, there are a lot of people who design fonts and things who I think could really make a meal out of designing a parametric generative font system for the books of all the different lengths. There's also, I mean, I would love to do it tastefully, but there is this character design problem regarding the librarian. And I think there are a lot of people who do excellent work um, with regards to compelling uh, characters and things. So, you know, a lot of what, a lot of what like sold public science talks at the Exploratorium was putting a lot of visual interest into them, and I think that um, that can really keep people cozy while they're while the bigger ideas are sort of coming into focus. So I, I, I think I'm partial to the idea of a book, although I think animation does kind of help get the point across. So I, I think I'm open to other concepts as well. Oh, uh, so this is sort of a presentation to category theory. Yeah. So How would you change this for non-category theorists? Well... Slow it down by a factor of 10. <laughs> okay, was it too fast? No, it wasn't for us. It wasn't for them, but for me. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, that's okay. I'm not your audience. No, no, no. Well, I think, I, I think you are, actually. I mean, this is kind of my point, is that, like, creating... Like, I was saying this earlier, like... Um, this book puts some, it, it, it would put some demands on you. And I think in the same way that Surreal Numbers or To Mock a Mockingbird really, they're not quite textbooks, but they do require a certain amount of studiousness and like, there's a certain amount of like cognitive endurance needed to get through those books properly. Um, and I really don't think there's any way of conveying category theory that isn't gonna put some demands of that sort on, on the learner. I think my, my hope is that, you know, the reason like I think the, I, sh I showed those three books that talk about the library. I, I've done talks where I've invoked the library in other contexts before, and I just find that like the library itself is a really good hook. It's a nice swap out for more abstract mathematical cons considerations. And there's something very congenial and about just hanging out in your imagination in a big Borgesian library and thinking about books and things. So I think like that's my main <laughs> that's my main offering to like try and make this a little more human in terms of its surface of contact. Very well. <laughs> <laughs> because you, know, you talked about limits and co limits. That actually yeah, I, 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 I knew I was. <laughs> so I, I just take it on faith. And, I, I knew I was not going to be accommodating you <laughs> particularly I know, well. Okay, but you're talking to you. Sure, sure. That's the right level for this audience. So. Yeah. What about before the limits become limits? Yeah, the, the uh, library was appealing, and then after that, it's like, and why am I here? I, I, yeah. I, there was no purpose to. The story needs a, uh, you know, I'm just going to say that. It's not a story yet. It, it's not a story, but even for category theories, it's not a story. Okay? And I think that's part of the problem with category theory itself. The way that it's <laughs> theory. No, no, not with itself, actually. Yeah, yeah. The way that it's being presented. Because it, it, it's open. You see, it arose inductively from having, from people who effectively were doing it, say, in algebraic topology, and then realizing that this is generalizable. 
Yeah. So that, that point was already known to the people and they were just abstracting it away. But now when we're describing the abstract thing, it's not clear why we're doing it. So there is no catch to the story, even like why are you doing it? Is this yet another representation of inset? That's how you, okay. And so we can fill in the gaps, but why would you bother doing it? So, um, see what I'm I, I totally see what you're saying. No, and I, and I, I, I so, so there's, uh, there's a few things you could do. Um, and I think a lot of it's like how, like part of it is I'm trying to do a presentation that is not strictly mathematical in the way that, um, when it, the way that it's normally phrased in, in, in category theory textbooks. Um, again, there's a way of reading graphs into a uh, fin set. There's also a way of looking at any span and thinking of it as a matrix. Um, there are ways of like looking at a section of it and seeing the natural numbers. So there's a bunch of reading interpretations into the library. And the beauty of it is that like when you come up with this notion of a limit, you have this, like the librarian doesn't know what a graph is or a matrix or even a letter. But this notion that you share with the librarian of a limit has meaningful applications to all of those interpretations. So that, that interpretive layer might be a way to ground this in actual mathematical concepts. And then I think it's just really breathtaking to see that, you know, the fixed points of a graph obey the same structure as you can get. Like, take, it's so satisfying to work out using co-limits to multiply two matrices represented as spans and to find that that crazy number weaving you do gives the same result as this universally defined thing at the level of compositions. But then you can go into numbers and get, you know, products or, what is it, least common multiples or min or max. Like, there, you know, there, there's a lot of standard ways. Like, I mean, I feel like conceptual mathematics is almost a textbook of ways to read um, different models into set. So anyway, I don't know. That's, that's one thought about how to get. Can you do something that you could, can you do something easy, more easily in this representation than that would surprise one of us? That would say, oh, that's really cool. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, I sure hope so. An interesting story. Does, I mean, to me, this is a setting for a story to be told, but you need to have a well of the, a, a language Paul, you began by saying sort of in, in the both pedagogical and sort of the, the difficulties as a learner of category theory, that there's something interesting about a, a shift in perspective. And to me, I, I mean, I'm not sure that I captured that appropriately, but to me there's something in your introduction of the character of the librarian that is about the universal perspective or something like that. You know? Yeah, and I, I, I kind of, can I, yeah, I, I sort of, I was going to talk about that and I kind of blew through it because um, I was <laughs> just getting tired. <laughs> but yeah, so, so here's the, like the thing I remember, like I tried to learn category theory probably three or four times before it worked. And all of those times, it was just like trying to eat something that wasn't food. Like it truly was an awe, like it was a peculiar sensation. And I just couldn't, like, Okay, I'm being asked to pretend that I don't know what the objects are, even though I do, so I'm pretending something. And I'm being asked to pretend that I know that this morphism composed with this morphism is this morphism, even though it's hard for me to imagine how I would possibly know that, other than by paying attention to the internal details, which I'm pretending not to know. And then you get all these definition on, def definitions on the basis of those compositions. So I get this cancellation law for, morphism, for monomorphisms, where I got two arrow, if two arrows coming in composed with this arrow equal the same thing, then these two must be, arrow, must be the same for all such pairs in the entire category. And this feels like a completely inactionable definition. I'm used to like, you know, it's a one-to-one -one map. I can look at a given like, function and decide whether or not it's one-to-one. -one. This, I'm gonna, am I gonna check composition with every single pair in the entire category? Like it feels weirdly non-operational. Like I can't, I can read the definition, I can understand it, but I can't imagine that happening in real life that I would use. Like I'm just, I have the wrong expectation about what it's for. So I think what's valuable to me about the librarian is that it gives you a place from which to suspend your disbelief, so to speak. It sort of embodies that cognitive dissonance in a fictional character and sort of invites you to indulge this long enough to see that there is actually useful deductive reasoning that can be carried out with the benefit, with the benefit of knowing that point of view is coherent, even if you yourself don't have it. And I feel like that's sep that my hope is that that could separate out a tension that I think I was really feeling uh, when I was first trying to learn category theory. So I don't, I don't know if that makes sense. I can try to say what I'm getting out of this, which is that a whole bunch of examples of categories often tend to learn are what are called concrete categories, where the objects are sets with extra structure, and the morphisms are functions that preserve this extra structure. 
Uh, and so, but the definition of the category says there's nothing about it being concrete. The objects aren't sets. Um, and so there's a kind of cognitive dissonance in learning category theory if you're in the unfortunate situation where all the examples that you know about are concrete <laughs> categories. Uh -huh. and, and, the, and but the definition is, is uh, not about concrete categories. And so in some ways, you're using the librarian as sort of the, like the, as the passage from the concrete category to the, to the, to the definition of an abstract category. So there's this concrete way to compose books where you actually look at the letters and you do this stuff and then mm -hmm. you know what you're, what you're doing. But then there's this librarian who all they can tell you is basically like when one morphism composed with another morphism is another morphism. Right. And, and so you could try to phrase that as a kind of, you could try to pose some kind of games or puzzles like what can you figure out just by asking questions of the librarian? Those yeah. Would be just the questions that could be answered using the, the abstract approach to category theory, not the concrete one. Yeah. Now, I don't know how to convince <laughs> a normal person that this is like a worthwhile <laughs> per pursuit. This uh -huh. why you know why should you limit yourself in this funny way of only asking yourself so that you can answer abstractly? My mm. my own way to try to sell categories is to come start in very early on with a bunch of examples of categories that aren't concrete. Uh -huh. um, and often very small categories, like categories with five objects or two right, objects right, right. Or something like that. Uh, to really break break away from the dissonance of only knowing concrete examples and also this other aspect which is that most of the con examples of categories that most people get told are these uh, enormous categories. Uh -huh. like all, even all finite sets is already pretty large. <laughs> that's like really small compared to, to the kind that mathematicians normally meet. And so that, 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 that business of dealing directly with enormous categories, I find, makes people s sort of scared. Whereas I can do lots of examples where I can draw the whole right, category right, right. on the blackboard. It uh -huh. makes it a little less scary. Yeah, I, w I always like to draw a house. It's a commutative triangle on a commutative square, and this is my go-to like small category. Yeah, when that's it good. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That kind of thing. So people who like graph theory and things like <laughs> like these smaller categories, I mm -hmm. think. I think. I mean, that's something you can actually see. Yeah. Uh, David, you were? Well, yeah, I just thought that like the librarian represents the category theory that you didn't understand at first. In some sense, like the, the guy who understands the whole thing but doesn't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Uh huh. Have one space in it. Yeah. And that, that it, the guy's like, oh, there's five letters in the. In this oh, that's yeah, that's so interesting. Explain it. The, 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 the librarian is thinking of it as the books. That's okay. Everything you say when you say letter, the, the librarian will be able. To, you'll be able to converse with them, even though you have translated. Um, it's kind of an it's an interesting thought. I was kind of like, sorry, I'll get back to this. Um, you know, like I was thinking about like the, that definition of a monomorphism is exactly what the librarian can see. It can see that everything impending on the back of this arrow gets a unique com composite, right? And that's like, the librarian's interesting because that's the kind of definition that would be obvious to it. And I was kind of saying that like, whereas the librarian finds our definition super crazy because we're using this ridiculous assembly language and this unnecessarily like sequential reasoning. You could teach them but I, yeah, I, what a letter is and what a... I, I I like, yeah, so I, I, I love co-discovering with the librarian. It feels like a way friendlier style of engagement. Right. Um, that is how a, a mathematician is not a category theorist. <laughs> to it. They're, they're, the, they're the you character. You're talking to a librarian. The librarian speaks this language when they can do all these crazy stuff, but they can't they understand the most basic. <laughs> 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 so, so to understand, like in the book, um, Shogun, you, you go in and you're the, you're the like, English person and you go into foreign culture, and they're like crazy people. And by the end, you are <laughs> like Japanese, and you think English people are crazy people. And like, to be able to do that reversal, where you like enter as a person who doesn't understand why the librarian is anything at all interesting, and leave thinking the librarian is a genius or something, <laughs> you might be a kind of uh, a way to make a story out of it. Or, um, yeah, yeah. Well, another thing 
getting back to what both of you said is that for somebody like me, who um, I am motivated to try and understand it only because of my current circumstances. <laughs> 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 Yeah, but I, and I would say that that remains the outstanding problem with category theory in yeah. general, is that like, it's very hard to get excited about something that you can't preview what it's about until after you've, you've learned it. So I don't think, I don't I think, think it's there are ways of making it more accessible. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know how to do it. Yeah. Well, an there is an origin story. Uh, what was it? The historical origin. And you don't have to tell me the details of, right. of that field, but you can tell me the emotions and what they were, and give me the flavor of Yeah, and also not just the initial origin, but I mean, there are many things that happen in the development of category theory that are amazing results and discoveries that you can talk about without getting into all the nitty gritty details. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think, I think that any particular approach to category theory like this one should can only really work well if it's part of a, of a bigger mix of different introductions to category theory. And that's true with all, every sort of subject. So like when I'm trying to learn physics or explain physics, like the history of physics is equally important to the physics. You cannot just say like, okay, the universe is made out of three kinds of quarks <laughs> and eight gluons and stuff like this. It means nothing at all to people. And the only way you could ever understand it is through the history of it, along with other approaches. Yeah. So well, this is a this is a non-historical approach, but it could be blended with, with I history. would say if you can cap there's something in epic that, that you all you all write some cool things. <laughs> 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 yeah, and you talk about, about the beauty of this and the other. and if you can somehow up front get that across. Yeah. Here's my yeah. current way to <laughs> no, I, the reason I'm yeah, <laughs> what I know so far, um, and it might be wrong, uh, there's levels of abstractness in mathematics. And, uh, and abstraction is an extremely, is the powerful idea in mathematics. And um, uh, category theory sits at the top of that. That's the other thing. That's what I think. And so I re that makes me want to uh, understand what that thing is. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I don't know, do you, do you know the idea that there can be like variables and there's like some, you can have say the temperature and the temperature can change so it's a variable and you have the length of things. You're like drawing a rope and then it can get longer as you pull it out from wherever it is, the amount of rope you have. And so that's a variable with the amount of sunlight can change and all that. Yeah. And category theorists have the brilliant idea that it's not that it's not just that you have these variables all around you, but you know two things about them. You know what they are, what kind of thing they are, right? So a temperature, if you're measuring on a little thermometer, it might be this position on up and down the thermometer. So you know that the temperature variable is that thing. And then you also know what other kinds of things in the world are going on that that matter to that variable, that that variable actually varies with. So if the temperature in the room is different in different parts, like if I go over there yeah. in the sun, it gets a little warmer, and if I'm over here in the shade, it's a little cooler, that I know that as I move around the room, the temperature varies. So not only is the temperature, do I know what it is, it's a little position on my thermometer, but also I know that it varies specifically over where I am in the room. And so if I have another variable, which is where I am in the room, and that's changing, and I get up and I walk around, then I, and I know what that depends on, say that depends on, I'm going to take a planned walk, as if I'm a very boring person, I'm going to take a planned walk around the room. And so the way I go around the room is kind of coordinated with the, the stopwatch and where it is on my hand. And as my stopwatch goes around and around, I'm walking around the room. And so now I have, 
I know that my, where I am in the room is a variable. It's where I it's a position in the room. That's what kind of thing it is, and the kind of the variable it's depending on is where my stopwatch is, and so I can predict from that that I'm going to, that where my thermometer is going to be up and down, which is the thing that goes up and down, is going to be depending on where that my stopwatch is, and I don't have to remember in the middle where I was going to the room, and that's the that's the idea. That's that a kind of good example. Yeah, that's that's that's, that's, the, that, that's the kind of example that if you can make that into something really really relevant and interesting is. I, I, you I, I, told well, me a model, yeah, and you didn't tell me what's what's the punchline. What's what's, what's the, the insight? What did I what? what um, I guess the insight is that if you so uh, we're interested in, in the variables, but we're also interested in the kinds of things those variables are. So we're not just interested in one temperature, we might be interested in all the possible temperatures and what temperature means. Sure. And what category theory tells you is that what temperature means is all the ways you can have variable temperatures and all the ways they can depend on every other variable. And so what I heard in that, that would be the so punchline. you haven't answered the question at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not interested yet. Scott, can I try and answer yeah. it? Well, that's different than can I not try answer it. Yeah. So, so for me, listening I hear, oh my God, the world is much more complex than I was thinking, but it can be expressed using these two parameters, mathematically. I don't know what the relationship is. It's a cool example, but I don't know what the relationship to the category theory is. He was describing the type of objects in the category, the type of the objects and the, the way they depend for the morphism. A variable is a morphism. And the, the, the thing that sort of was invented in algebra, the category theorists make use of fundamentally is that you have a domain of the morphism of the codomain, which didn't appear in the books. It's like this inversion as well. I mean, historically, <laughs> it started with a variable. And then later on, people were like, oh, this is a variable of something that depends on something else. And only then can you have the notion of the category. So like the idea is that you have the variables, and then substituting in one variable and another is composition. Category theory says that you can do effectively anything you want in math with that fundamental idea. But also, I, I guess that it's, it's, it's good to actually do that. I don't know how to say that. <laughs> yeah. Then one of the reasons, oh, sorry, I'm just going to say this and I'll shut up. One of the reasons this is so passionate for me is we've got to be able to explain math, not just to explain what Topo is which we struggle with every single day, but what category it is, yeah. and, and why it should be more recognized and incorporated in our lives. Yeah, so the obvious question is, so why, as a, a public member, do I care? What, what problem will I help solve? I would suggest we like, save that till after. Paul's up there because this. Oh, sorry. I, 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 sorry, Paul. This is a version from over dinner we discussed right? like category three more broadly and kind of at least well, for me. Okay. I would, yeah. Have this I got it. Okay. Sorry, Paul. No, that's sure. okay. Uh, Nelson. Nelson. Yeah. So I guess what I wanted to say is it, I'm probably just reflecting what you already said back at you, but like part of this is about how to get people engaged in category theory, and I think this already you can set it up in a way if you use a game. For example, you can set it up in a way that people will already feel kind of motivated by playing this game. And you could set up this game like, hey, I'm this person who like understands this like letter formulation here, but I have to communicate these commands or like these instructions to this librarian in a way only the librarian will understand, but the librarian un understands some really weird stuff. And so I have to kind of figure out how to get the idea of a letter across. And some, like the insight that I come across is like, oh, the librarian will understand it. If I say that it's a morphism, it's a morph, right? Like, or like the equivalent of what it would be in the story. And I can see that set up as like a game that like progressively gets harder and harder. And like you, and you, you would, I, I think I would like, I, I'm just imagining people, right? Like, I think people would like playing that and like trying to figure out, and it would be a certain type of person who would like playing that, but like, I think people would get engaged in that and just find that interesting sort of for its own sake, which doesn't obviously answer the question of like, <laughs> how do you actually like, convince people that category theory is actually important, no, but it, well, does, no. it does get like, people like, playing it with it already, which I think is the first step. But I, do, I am also curious of the second step, which is how do you actually like, 
<laughs> sell this perspective? How do you actually show that this perspective to actually make a good story? I think that's almost answered in your question, though, because as you learn to express yourself in this language, you begin to see you know you can express these crazy things that you cannot express in like other, other languages, and then that, that just expressive power of the language is ultimately what sells it. Yeah, I think that's like, so for example, it's a game. Well, can I, can I just say, just say, like, I, like I, I love the characterization. I think it is, I think, yes, the spirit of it should be as a game. It doesn't just get harder, though. It's that these, these are the concepts you're going to work through. So this is the real payout, right? The problem is, like, it's hard to, it's hard to preview at the beginning what's going to come out of this. But these are, like, there's a really great way of implementing representable functors using this metaphor. Um, limits and, like, I don't know. There, there, there's a lot of meat here to, to dig into. You know, what we what we saw today was the setup, and uh, that was sort of the preamble to the actual main course. I, I nonetheless think that how you preview it and how you frame it is important for inviting people in. Um, but I, I just do want I do want to make the disclaimer that there there is there is there is more under the hood in the in the premise. Um, what was your name? Christian. Christian. I just wanted to say uh, I think this is a fantastic metaphor, a fantastic story. Uh, and we don't have a wealth of um, these kind of metaphors yet. You know, we don't have a wealth of these kind of interpretations. And I think this is a really novel one that is going to change how I think about Vincent. <laughs> um, and it seems like one that can genuinely spark students' imagination. Um, I mean, tons of things in school do not need uh, some application in mind to to justify them. I really believe that, that some of the deepest value of education is in, is in just sparking imagination for its own sake and, and giving people these ways of thinking. I think that's already valuable on its own. And um, yeah, I just wanted to, to say this is a really nice way of looking at this category. Like, And one of the things is like how the metaphor, like you said, makes the morphism the fundamental thing rather than the objects, I think that's huge because that's one of the deepest lessons about category theory is, is focusing on processes rather than things. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just think this is awesome and I, I bet that all of these constructions are going to be meaningful within this metaphor and you can get students thinking about like how to represent, you know, real world languages or like what it means to translate between things and, and all kinds of games that, that you can play and like, especially when you brought in the librarian about like how to represent like the, um, that kind of cognitive dissonance that you felt and, and make it just this uh, external thing so that you don't have to like assume both roles, all that stuff, I, I just think it's great. It's fantastic, thank you yeah. for saying that. Yes, yeah, so, so the, the selling point is that this is really trippy. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, we all like surreal. Uh, Joshua? Yeah. Uh, I want to mention that uh, Emily Wheel and, and two other category theorists were on Science Friday. Maybe you heard it. No. And, and, and uh, you know what happened is. Emily Wheel. It's an NPR show. It's fantastic. Um, and uh, the, the host was somewhat skeptical of it. The host was somewhat skeptical if there'd be interest, and the, the phone rang off the hook <laughs> for category wow. theory. Yes. Ama <laughs> amazing. Because uh, it's the same thing I feel, it's which is like, L's. there's something they really cool there. there. Yeah. I want to understand it. Yeah. Even if I don't know what it is, I just sense there's something cool there. Yeah. So I, I do want to mention it's 5.30. I'm happy to keep talking, but uh, um, can we do one more question? Josh, we'll Josh set his, his hand up. Yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, I, I think that this is like a great stepping stone to help students make some of the major conceptual shifts that are needed for category theory. The idea of looking at morphisms rather than objects is great that you're building that in with the idea of books. Morphisms are now these physical objects, and objects are not even a thing really. Objects are really are just like, I don't know, alphabets, I guess. But um, yeah, the, the conventional perspective makes, does focus on books rather than alphabets. So that's mirrored in how category theory focuses on more and rather than objects, so that's correct. And then uh, the librarian, just knowing how everything combines without actually knowing what anything is, is <laughs> great. That is the perspective. Yeah, so this would really help students make this shift. 
one potential uh, one potential challenge when teaching this, I think, would be to explain what composition means. Because um, it's not really a natural thing to do with two books. Uh, yeah. Unless yeah, they have true. very small alphabets. Like your people are used to doing sites. That's a lot of decoder ring was. That's yeah, like decoder. Yeah, yeah, decoder yeah. ring is pretty pretty yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you do those with small alphabets. You don't do that with an alphabet that's like thousands of characters long generally. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm, just, I'm not saying you can't explain it. I'm just saying it's, it's some kind of challenge. Yeah. Also, another thing you can, another thing you, another like next thing you can do with the story is you can have the person visit a library where they don't even get to see the books at all, and they just talk to the librarian, and it's just some other category. Well, so they ask the librarian like how many books are there, and the librarian's like five, and they have to like. <laughs> <laughs> well, so where, where this wants to go is that you, you have the librarian and you, you and the librarian share FinSet in that I can look into the books and he can see what, what uh, the continental s compositional structure is. But then the librarian should also be able to offer the same service for other categories. And we think like this, I was <laughs> these are graphs. <laughs> This is the domain graph, this is the codomain graph, and this book represents a homomorphism. This is a post set, this is a post set, this is a post set morphism. So I can have these libraries, and the thing is, what does the inside of this look like? How have I encoded uh, that these graphs are homomorphed into each other or whatever? And the answer is, who cares? Because I'm just gonna use my vocabulary with the librarian. We're gonna keep these books on the shelves. We're never gonna look inside of them. Like the value of having the librarian is that you start in this place where you do inspect the contents of the book and then you start comparing it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like ultimately, ultimately you want to set up functors. So you're going to need the librarian to be able to say like, I see the entirety of this category and I see copies of it inside of this one. And those are my, <laughs> my functors. It's a good secondary intent. Anyway, All right. Thank you.